So how's your day? Very good, thank you. Thanks for having me, Hamish. You're welcome. So we have the one and only Nasim Nasser. Is that how I pronounce it? That's Beautiful. correct. And you are an internationally acclaimed artist that heralds from Adelaide originally. That's correct. And of Iranian heritage. Yes. And you've been very active when it comes to like a calling, like a call to the wild to make a difference with what's going on in Iran now. Um, yeah, indeed. Um, that was the question I was asked in Adelaide when I started studying my Master in Visual Art at UniSA. That are you an artist or activist? And I said, I'm, I believe every artist is an activist. It's just your choice to want to push that to public and plat your platforms or you just want the activism be hidden in you um, because artists are the most sensitive um, humans uh, when it comes to effects and issues in the world and um, they have expressed their pain through their um, visual platform. Therefore, um, I do believe every artist is an activist so I am too when it comes to very important issues yeah fair enough i feel like especially when we look at art across the ages it's the art that actually has those like political motivations that tend to stand the test of time because they count as like the the retelling of history more than anything um that's correct uh but also right now because my practice is very contemporary art we are very um much um trying to address what is now, what is happening now. Of course, we are informed by the history. And then we quickly have to jump on the issues that are somehow painful or shocking or uh, bothering the general public. So we kind of go through that channel and try to see how we can see it and how we can express it. Not all the artists, but majority of artists um, in contemporary art are moving towards that. Um, and of course, the history informing us all the, all the way mm. to be able to make contemporary w art. Well, definitely the better artists because the more educated you are about history, I find like. Absolutely. You just Education it is everything, Hamish. Like, um, it's incredible what's happening in the world. And when there is a lack of education about the history of anywhere, even about Australia, about, about any. In that, core that and I'm not talking about like just the last 50 years you have to go back and then come towards now to have good grasp of what's going on and um, doesn't matter if it doesn't come to your work but it is profoundly important to be come constantly educating ourselves so how have, let's go back let's go back into the life of Nassim <laughs> how did you educate yourself in life my father, so he's a very well-read medical doctor and his library is like as big as a penthouse. So for me, I walk up to, I was very privileged to wake up to this kind of um, world of learning and knowing about different countries, histories and platforms, even though I was very visual and I, I always, from very early on, I knew that um, there is something in my heart that I am, exp I am just always, I'm asked, I've been asked many times and I don't know why it's, when I want to express, I can't write a book, but I can easily put it in a visual platform, photography, video, painting, drawing, um, multidisciplinary live performance art. So yeah, the core of my education is my father. And the reason I'm in Australia is my father too. Yeah, how um, did you guys get here? So. I was um, discovered that I can paint and draw the best at very uh, primary school. And um, so um, my parents decided to uh, encourage me to continue the um, drawing and painting and all of those um, mediums back in Iran. I was born in Tehran. And then uh, I went to art school and I realised I can never show my painting and drawing because there's always a sense of nudity or naked woman in my work. And, um, and it was always 
like I don't want to do what society want me to do and I always raise against it one way or another I was always against traditions and classic moves if everyone celebrates something I didn't want to do it and I don't know why but I was always against something that push you and control you and therefore I was told very early on you're not allowed to draw paint or paint nude body a woman in Iran in Iran yeah and then I was doing it naturally I was just kept drawing and and addressing then the naked body of a woman and I just it was like my revenge I wouldn't do what people tell me not to um you little rebel I know the original I was like, rebel and how my, old were you my, at this stage I, I, at that time I was like um 16 to 18 when I was going through exams to go to Tehran University to study art and then when I went to art school which was uh, very difficult to get into in in Tehran. Um, it's very difficult exams you have to pass. I passed it. I got there, and then again, I knew that I can't show my work. My father was like, "This is not going to be your path. You're just going to another country. I've made the decision. You're going to Australia, not America, because we have political issues with America as Iranians." Not England because we can't afford it. The pound was very expensive for us. Mm. And uh, Canada was difficulties to get permission from universities, so it was Australia. What's, and the, what's the political issues with America? Well, historically, we have Iran and America um, have quite a huge um, dynamics. Um, and even up to today, we can see it clearly. Um so the the situation when 1979 happened in Iran with Shah and um, and uh, the uh, issue of the oil between Iran and America is always a huge one and um, so throughout history the play power play between Iran and America has been very strong and every time the negotiations don't go ahead. Um, normal people get affected by sanctions and others and, and the publicly will be shamed and named. Um, because people's educations are very limited about the core of all of this. So my dad didn't want us to be going to universities when these things can affect us somehow or publicly in America. If something goes wrong with Iran, with oil contracts and, and you know, n- nuclear deals and this and that. So it was much safer to study in Australia and not even go through all of those conversations in with Americans. Yeah, because it, it, so, you know, there's like social like bastardization if there is those tensions. Is that what you're saying? Exactly. From like a human level in yes, terms of studying there? Absolutely. It has okay. happened quite often. And then just like even when in TV they show something about um, Iran, I'm talking about like 10 years ago, 15 years ago, it was always like attention publicly toward Iranians and and you knew it has nothing to do or the sanctions affected normal people, for example, they never affected um, the power players mm. and people had money bans when, uh, for example, if I was uh, studying in America and the sanction that happened in Iran uh, through Trump and others um, affected my parents sending money to me because the money would be banned to get to America. So these sort of things would affect human, mm. r- normal people rather than... Um, I didn't expect... F- I didn't know see, flow of money it got was, affected like It was that. an issue. I, um, I was going to send a money to... Uh, a writer f- uh, who wrote uh, an article about my art practice in Australia for Huffington Post. And then he said to publish it, it would cost me like, let's say, $100 Australian. And I was going to send from Australia to America, but my passport back then was still Iranian passport. And there was a sanction in Australian bank that mm. as an Iranian in Australia, I couldn't even send money to America. Wild. And that's a personal experience. So that's yeah. how very like no, normal people get affected by all of these political issues between the two countries. So Australia was the right place to come and start. And it was Adelaide that gave me the uh, permission to study in uh, University of South Australia. And I started my life in Adelaide. And um, very special city, still very special in my heart. And um, gave me such platform, in fact... Uh, created my career um, because of Maslin Beach, a nude beach that exists <laughs> in South Australia. Such a good beach. <laughs> Started my whole career because I was taken there by um, 
friends just to see how nude beach is because of my background drawing and painting nude and naked women and I just walked there and I wasn't allowed to wear anything all the signs were saying you're not allowed to wear anything and you get fine and I hate that flashback to Iran life for women you get fine if you have a bit of hair showing you get punished morality police comes and takes you Oh my God, like there was complete contrast. And um, and then because I don't want to be told, you know, what to do, and I wore my grandmother's uh, chador, burka, like chador head covering black. And I, and I walked on the beach and took multiple photographs and videos of myself. And with every, clothes on? With or? clothes on and the head covering a hijab, the yeah. full hijab on Maslin Beach. Okay. So I was the most visible creature on the beach. Just as a little revenge now that instead of me drawing, drawing nude and naked bodies, I'm actually going to be the mm, performance artist of this project and wearing something that covers me head to toe in a nude beach. And that was my first series of works that was taken to a lot of um, exhibitions and publications and, you know, been written extensively about. And so Adelaide <laughs> has so much... Um, has given me so much. How did you go about getting those first pieces like into the actual art world? Uh, because I was a student at Uni USA and my supervisors were connecting me to um, quite a lot of um, people who are writers, curators and I remember one of my um, Supervisors Greg Donovan and the other one Mark Kimber both told me um, your work you make more work than we've seen any other students make, um, and you can easily fill up few galleries for your uh, final presentation. So they helped me to get Experimental Art Foundation in Line Art Center and Nexus Gallery um, all together to. Um, put my final presentation in 2011 on display, which was a public display. Um, and I was putting up a performance art of actual Australian models back then from Tanya Powell Modeling Agency. Tanya Powell! I used all her models and That's she so became, cool. became my MC for the performance. For real. I have an interesting connection to Tanya Powell as well. Oh, oh my God. So I... Oh, so much to that woman because she immediately understood my concept and what it all means that I'm doing. And, of course, I was, again, working with the concept of a woman covering body and hijab and forced hijab and what it means to be controlled. My work always trying to seek liberation and freedom and, and showcase the cultural contrast. Between so Australia, between Australia between and between what, my past in Iran and my present life in Australia. So my Australian models were on the catwalk wearing that uh, hijab on the catwalk and telling my stories and also in the background they were telling me their feeling about what they're doing. So it was part of my thesis um, or exegesis of my master degree. Um, so they contributed so much to my um, research so, but then that final presentation got aired on ABC News, and as a result, an Adelaide gallery, Paul Greenaway, took my artwork uh, and uh, became my uh, gallery for eight years. And now I have a new gallery in Melbourne, Mars Gallery. So it's really like the everything linked together. But I never made artwork to really come to the market. I always made artwork because Australia and Adelaide gave me the freedom to do so. And I think any artist in the world knows what freedom of expression means. And that meant so much to me when I arrived in Australia. And I kept telling everyone in my, my speech, in my art talks, in conferences, I, lo I really, the only thing I want is to Australia know how lucky they are. It takes one from another part of the geography, like Iran, to know what f structure and what discipline means, what freedom of expression choice is and and I think people take it for granted in Australia and they always find something to complain whereas the reality um, of us in different part of the world is we are die to have every any moment like an Australian live here um, 
and I've experienced it now for 12, 13 years and I, I, every day I'm grateful to be here. Were you pretty worried when all the COVID lockdowns and stuff were going on, given that freedom such like a big part of your expression? Um, yes, it was challenging, but because of the experience of being completely captivated by Islamic regime in Iran, it's always part of our life as an Iranian. So the being captivated by COVID was nothing serious for us. We could really adjust. We could really understand. It's a health reason. It's this and that. We adapted. Um, and that I found it as Iranian Australian, we were okay to compare with Australian who born here and never have felt the the limitations in any other way. Um, we kept comparing, you know, we're constantly comparing, you know, this was just um, a health reason, okay, we don't go out, we don't do this, we don't do that, and we were, it, it hit me it, quite a lot because of my background, but it also felt it's not that challenging, we've, we've actually been challenged by another regime back in Iran heavily, this is nothing to compare. So what was it like growing up? As a woman in Iran, like what kind of challenges or control mechanisms and systems did you were you confronted with? Well, um, everyone's experience is different. I grew up in a very um, uh, privileged family where everyone's educated, where we very like a good upbringing. Um, but we also always been told it's much better everything to be indoor than you go to public. For example, party, any conversations about the regime, it has to be indoor. You just go out and you become something else. So you, you grow up being very bipolar, not by choice, but because of the regime. So you have liberation inside your home and then you have absolute control and lack of freedom in public areas outside your home. And what do you mean by control? Like, what did that actually so look like? So the control is you must wear a head of scarf, you must wear, you, you are not allowed to wear nail polish, you're not allowed to laugh loud in public as a woman. You're at university, every time I went to art university, at the door, the besiege, the morality police to stop us and make sure the hair is tucked in the scarf. Uh, my sister even once got caught um, in a shopping center because she was not wearing socks and wearing just the sandals. And um, and I was there, luckily, to rush to a shop and get a pair of socks for her. So you'd like you, you're not allowed to s- expose your beauty and skin, and that's simply Why? what's the thought behind that. So it comes from a very much Islamic uh, rules based on Quran that um, they have to. Um, uh, limit. They have to create limitations for women to be to be able to stop men from uh, being erected from women. That's a simple way to put it. And so to to avoid this, women has to be limited for men not to um, <laughs> be exposed to women's beauty. And that's just comes. It absolutely makes no sense. So instead of educating men not to be looking and having a gaze on women um, or looking into women as an object, they try to cover up women not to expose their beauty to men. So it's very much the basic Islamic rules, literally, that these mullahs brought to Iran, um, according to one of the brilliant writers, Ahmad Kasravi says, is divisive system. Divide men from women, brain from body, and um, humanity from society. And that's exactly what this regime has done to this country for 43 um, years now. Yeah, because Iran was pretty liberal before the regime started, right? Absolutely. So during the Shah time, um, there were issues with the Shah and the Shah's father, like Reza Shah and Mohammad Reza Shah. They, they did run for quite a while. Um, and they have advanced the system based on quite a lot of work and they created incredible lifestyle for people. Uh, but they have a very um, 
I don't, I don't think people were grateful for that. They always found something that they were not happy. And, and these uh, are the OG, like Iranian rulers before the Arabs came? Before, before the mullahs came, yeah. yeah. Okay. And then they slowly, slowly opened the doors for mullahs. And uh, the mullahs started crawling over the system very by small steps, like acknowledgement for the speech at the start of the speech to mullahs and Quran came to the world, starting changing the name of the streets to okay. mullahs' way. So slowly, it started like in slowly. the parliament to yes. have that Sharia acknowledgement of like Sharia law. Yes, and then the, sh- the, then the whole religious took over the political system. And and then 1979, people had another revolution when they kicked out Shah and the uh, mullahs came over. And then um, the mullahs brought this whole religious, Islamic religion uh, with their book, Quran, and then started ruling out the country very slowly. But, you know, and there was Iran and Iraq war right after the 1979 revolution when eight years of fight with Iraq happened so people were all traumatized by constantly going through these issues and thinking these mullahs would make things bring peace as you know every government every groups when they become when they t- uh, when they take over a power they promise so much mm. and people easily get fooled by all of those statements that they make Oh, we make the water bills free. We make the gas free, and the people loved all of that. So yeah, they bought really it. Really, just creates more reliance on the government more than anything. Exactly, and then when mullahs took over, then there's forty two years of battle with people being suppressed, oppressed, take the entire freedom of speech out of people. And right now, as you know, women life freedom is happening. And there's the reason that I'm in Australia is exactly lack of freedom for women in Iran. So, so how did you not get like persecuted in school if you were creating these naked underground? Everything was underground. And your, teach, your teachers school. knew about it? Yeah, I think art system, the art universities are incredibly understanding of what's happening and they allow students practice as long as they don't get discovered by the Islamic regime. So we had system underground, we were drawing, we had a naked nude model, we were sweating, we had someone outside the door waiting so no morality would come in. If they come, they will call us so we all pack immediately and the model get dressed and as if we are doing a criminal act. Wow. So it was very crazy and we still managed to do it and have that whole, you know, like months and months and months of those pra- art practice just like that. And you come here... And you have all the freedom in the planet in Australia to do what you want to do. So I created more work than any other student at university. And everyone was like, oh, how, can, how much time do you have to make art? And I was like, because I'm, I just, I can't believe I can make it. And that's why I never thought I'd make artwork in Australia to sell or to enter market. I was like, I have freedom of expression. I have to make this work. Oh my God, I have to say this. I have to do this video art. I, it was just constantly I wanted to as a revenge, make all these works. But then it was nothing about a nude and naked woman. It was exactly reverse. It was about a censored woman. It was about a woman in a form of limitation and lack of freedom. It was a myself in the video artist, only my eyes exposed, my lips exposed, my hands exposed, nothing else. And that contrast showed itself to my artworks. And I have never made an artwork with a nude or naked woman since I've been in Australia. It's very, like, complete contrast. Mm, Because so it's like showing what's on the other side of the pond because now you're surrounded by these people that have that. So you're like, here's what's on the other side of the pond. Let me gift you this knowledge of the complete opposite to what you experienced. Exactly. And it was a very much little understanding in generally speaking in Australia about what's happening in the uh, Middle East or in Iran. Um, so my work wasn't really understood. Um, it was great that I didn't give up and I kept on going and then it's 13 years of making these kind of works. But at the same time now, I get, I'm get i bombarded by these messages from my Australian, even the models who were on catwalk write me, oh, Nassim, you were exactly 
showing what's happening now in Iran. And I was like, yeah, but nobody could really digest it. Yeah, because you're like, it was already happening. I know, yeah. exactly. And I was like, I feel like my revolution has started from the moment I went to university of um, University of Western uh, UniSA, South Australia. Um, that was the time I started my revolution internally started to happen. And whatever I've created basically is saying whatever is now happening in Iran. Hmm. So let's get to the present day in a minute. Just take me through, like, what are the different collections as a part of your career? Like, uh, how many collections have you had uh, be in uh, gallery uh, over these years? Is it like you mean the art uh, yeah, exhibitions yeah, yeah. and everything? Yeah. So my work is now collected by Art Bank Australia and Parliament House in Canberra, and um, Art Gallery of New South Wales, uh, Jane and Brian Sherman, who are very senior art advocates in Australia. A lot of private um, collectors worldwide. Um, majority of the collectors, are, uh, of course, in Sydney and then quite a lot in Berlin and Singapore and Hong Kong and USA and, um, you know, scattered Dubai. And how many, like, exhibits have you done um, of collections of, of like... I think I, I have exhibited quite a lot. It's just how you have to go through my CVs. So I started with this small gallery in Adelaide called Format Artist Space next to University of South Australia. And then my solo show th for my pr final presentation. And then it took off to some international art fairs and in Hong Kong and Dubai that my gallery, Paul Greenaway, took my work um, and um, and then Tarawara Museum in Melbourne, and then it went to a S S San Martin School in London, and and then uh, I did this big performance number two of Women in Shadow in Sydney Powerhouse Museum. Did the documentation went to Paris and won an award by uh, Diane Pernet and Jean Paul Gaultier. In Paris, so that was a huge highlight. Did you get to go and, I, like, receive the award? I did, and I never thought I would win because they never allow anyone knows who's the winner. I literally went with my friend who made the documentation of the performance. Uh, we went together and we thought, we know, we would never win in Paris. Come on, there's Germany, there's Japan, there's London, there's Paris filmmakers, they're all there. I mean, we have really nothing to win next to those competitors and um let's go and f enjoy french champagne so we just went and then our name was called and we were the one of the winners and uh for bravery and courage to make such work and for those listening that aren't familiar with your artwork what was that uh piece so that's called women in shadow that was the number two the number one was my graduation uh performance that i did in adelaide um and that experimental. was the Maslin's beach stuff um that was uh models um tiny power models that going on a catwalk and wearing the hijab yep, yep. and then going from uh, like a burkini to be a bikini from from completely hijab to being their normal beach uh, body girls, which uh, shows two sides of fence. Like this side is, you know, from where I come from, Middle East, and everyone has to wear this head covering. And then the other side is this bikini models who always like on the beach and relaxing and they wear very minimal clothes. And uh, so the number two was in Powerhouse Museum where I staged uh, 45 minutes of live performance by, a again, real Australian models from different company, Wink and other companies. And, um, and then I went again from completely covered up on the stage and then they slowly uncover and their outfit get hold and laser cut and they get torn apart until they become bikini models as in you'd have each person like dressed up in the different stages and they'd keep yes, walking out yes and then and then did you make that clothes yes or did you i cost i was the costume designer sound designer um basically i've made everything and the models were uh going through expressing what i asked them to do um make up everything i was doing everything because i I just had to be in control of what I want people to see from it. 
if you could describe just for the people listening and they yes. can go and look at your yes. work um, in its full effect, what did that like? What was what does that aesthetic look like? So and at, sound like at the beginning, there is a whispering that I've made by five of my friends in a sound studio. We all saying, "Where are you coming from? What's your background? Um, where is home?" The three questions in a whispering mode, and that's in an absolute dark, pitch black room. And I had like 600 people sitting in there experiencing those questions because I think it's, they're very important questions. Where are you coming from? What's your background? Where is home? And then the light comes on, and then the models come on the stage with a particular sound mixed between Middle East and West. And then they're wearing this head-to-toe black chador, uh, only face exposed and a heavy eye makeup. And then they show and just show the audience what it means to wear that hijab, forced hijab. And is that heavy eye makeup, is that expressionist or is that something that people wear over there? It's, it's a, that's what they wear. It's a heavy eye makeup is one of the, because the only place you can expose is your face. So I think majority of women like to do a quite heavy eye makeup. I think even I've got it now. It's a very much of a culture and we are used to it. So I think um, they come to the stage um, I, I, and I allow my audience to read to it. I don't want to completely say what I want. But then they come through stages. Yeah, please keep talking. Okay, and then... Um, uh, so they come to the second stage. They come to, to catwalk when they're... Um, hijab is being laser cut by different alphabets the words that mean so so much to me and um, the next stage they slowly dance and twist and try to liberate themselves from wearing that forced outfit which is like a hijab and then the fourth stage they come back on the stage with bikini and then the last stage they come back on uh, with numbers, every time I cast models, Australian models, modeling agency shows me numbers. So it shows me the objectifying women still exist no matter where you are. And the models uh, are just the numbers. So the when I grew up in Iran, we always looked up to this catwalk fashion scenes as if those women have all the freedom to show their beauty and to expose their beauty, body, nakedness, whatever. When I came to Australia and studied this, I realised these women actually have very limited freedom because they're models and they're looked at as the most beautiful things on the catwalk. So they have no name and no identity, but they have extraordinary beauty and everyone's eyes are just scanning that beauty and that matters. So, for example, in the modeling agency, the model number 1 to 10 was most expensive, 10 to 20 cheaper, and you can have 30 for free. That kind of mentality. Like, these are absolutely not even human. And that's what goes on. Yeah, and therefore it's very interesting to sit and look into both side of fence and not to just think, you know, the freedom we think is not exactly what we think in and hearing this side of a story when models don't publicly want to be called models. They just really don't like their job. They feel very, sh- very actually embarrassed by it. Mm. Majority of them that have built friendship and they always say, oh, Nassim, please don't introduce me as a model. I really don't like to be named model. And I'm like, why? In Middle East, we are all looking up to you, thinking you're the most beautiful, the most, you know, f- you have the most freedom that anyone can uh, experience. And then yet they are very not satisfied. And what do you think? What like why do you think your friend said that? I think uh, I think it's based on the public pressure they experience and how they get looked at as this extraordinary beauty that has nothing else to offer. Yeah, it's like one dimensional. Exactly, because even few of them asked me to become my studio assistant, and 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 I have asked them, and they felt so liberated that they are doing something more meaningful. And then, um, and it was very interesting for me to see that dimension in what Middle Eastern women look up to as a form of, you know, freedom. Women who are absolutely free. And then they are finding limitation in that what they do. 
Um, yeah, it's very complex. Um, yeah, it's nuanced. And how how do you find people receive your art in terms of like the art world? How do you think they go about actually analyzing and un- completely understanding your message as you try to put it out? Like, is that important to you that the message is delivered in the way that you're thinking about it, or more that they're just getting a glimpse of that messaging in which you're giving out? I always say it's very important this this uh, way to look at art. I always say when a good what is a good art what, or what makes a good art a good art or good work. Um, it's when you look at an artwork and you see an impact in your body. For example, your eyes burst to tears, your cheeks warms up, your heart beats. You have goosebumps, your skin reacts, your legs feel a bit weak. That's when you know you're looking at something really strong and powerful. It could also be a movie that does this to you. It could also be a political message that does this to you. And when your body reacts, that means something is impactful. And when it's an art impactful, that does exactly that to your body. So... I um, always feel this is the completed work when someone feels something with it in their body. So when I do these performances, number one and number two, when I see my audience in tears, and they are pure Australian, indigenous, Asians, Europeans, you know, it's completely diverse backgrounds. And when I see them coming and saying, look at my goosebumps, look at my body reacting to this performance, look, I feel anxious, I can't just sleep tonight, I can't take it out of my mind, it's five years since I've seen your performance, I I still have flashback, then I know this has delivered the message, doesn't matter if it doesn't get collected, or it doesn't matter if it doesn't get exhibited again. And doesn't matter if I'm not showing in this extraordinary, like, you know, I'm not a mainstream artist, I can easily say that. But I feel like I've done that mission. This is done. I'm really happy that I've created that impact. Even one person is enough for me to feel it. But when I have such audience that they all feel the same, so I feel very content with I've I've produced the work I have. And, you know, it's I know so many people play incredible, you know, games and power games and get quickly very, very high up and they deserve it but I feel my mission is something else my mission is to tell these stories and use my freedom in Australia to educate inform Mm, as opposed to just creating an aesthetic that sells exactly and bring this bonding between the two cultures I always feel um, East is all about spirituality, warm family food, hospitality um, and West is all about discipline, organizations. Um, it's West is very square. It's very clean. Yeah. It's very tidy. And then East is very messy, but yet it's so deep mm. and so spiritual. And therefore, it's like a yin yang. They have to come together. And I forever want within my performance, my photographs, my self-portrait to bring these two as a link that we need both of this to complete each other. More separation, it just creates more anxiety for the world. And, and, and that kind of, I'm hoping, that shows through my practice. That's so cool. Thanks. That's so cool. I'm like feeling it. I'm feeling it because I've had a lot to do with like your more... Not necessarily like Eastern Europe in terms of like, or like East culture as much, but like your Greece, for example, like which I feel like has a lot of that messy, like passionate kind of fiery, just like family loving. And that's what life's about. Like even when I was in Greece, it was like life is about enjoying life. Like it's not about creating like New York is or it's not about, um, you know, what London is like, you know, creating, creating, creating. It's like just about enjoying and experiencing and being there with one another 
Absolutely. Um, the bonding that happens internally, for example, in Middle East is just extraordinary. But then you come to the West and you feel the individuality and the strength in everyone so individual, everyone so strongly, you know, one person. And you look after yourself from young age, you get into the business world from young age and you build your life on your own. So this is very much not happening in Middle East. So um, so that's also in Greece or also in um, quite a lot of ancient um, countries with ancient cultures. Um, it's it's uh, Everything has 50% good and bad in it. So you, you could never say either this is good or that. I love that independent life in Australia that people have. I have neighbors, they're solos and they in old age they go to hospital and they look after themselves. And you go to any Middle Eastern family, the member goes to hospital, there are twenty people going there and <laughs> following. And it's so true. It's just so uh, extremely um, um contrast of culture. But yet there are good things in that and there are good things in being independent, there are bad things in you know, having that group of family living in each other's pocket and constantly being bothered by each other and yeah, then you know like, talking you about know, me. it's <laughs> like family members sometimes are like oh but um yeah so there is this is, for me is life is observa- observation of the two cultures which i find an extreme opposite in many ways but i still love to create that bonding and that link that brings each t- closer to each other somehow so cool and so the and you're saying that you're not a mainstream artist but i feel like you winning awards and showing around the world like isn't that mainstream um i think mainstream is when you get um you know they're just the big major galleries constantly uh collect your work and show and put you on display and and so constantly you become a cover you make a cover magazine and they and they're very good leading artists in Australia that are doing that fantastically well and and you know you watch them and you kind of you know part of human nature wants to be that and then you feel like no I don't want to change my way of work just to get there I don't want to become that um factory that constantly makes same work same work same work every time my heart and goes through and that's what it takes it it is because you realize your work is well received so you're constantly doing the same work if i do win an award and i think okay this this i'm going to do 12 20 performance of exact same thing mm. you know then people get to know me more and more and more and i become more popular whereas yeah, okay. i only make work when i feel pain and my heart goes to shock and i completely my new series of work is always different from the last work Mm. there is a link yeah okay they so all how, link. how i would look at that is like what it takes to be mainstream in the art world is like having your identity as a fashion brand as a comparison and then being your self-expression is kind of like what kendrick lamar's done with his music in terms of switching it up every single album but i think music it just has a bit that capacity to stay that when you are yeah you know, those few that get go to that in contemporary art, there's no wrong and right. One thing works for some and the other doesn't. Male artists seems to really dwell on what makes money and constantly go and make similar work because that's they need that Sufficient. income. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yep. And then I think female artists less so. But um, but again, if you make a work that creates such a popular, makes you win a award, and then you, in 30 years, you're still making the same work, but different colors and different patterns. And that's one good idea. Mm. As uh, Maria Abramovich says in, in her f- speech, is like and every artist has one or two great ideas. And they really constantly dwell on it and make every, every music album. There's one really good song in then the rest of the songs follow and somehow never can be as powerful if that really one good song. Um, or maybe two maximum in every album. I think that's where... I think it depends on the artist. <laughs> Pretty, um, <laughs> yeah. Music's like my main thing. So then you know. So yeah, maybe yeah, yeah. It's, I always Definitely you, depends there's on the one that hits really yeah, um, for powerfully. For most artists, definitely. Yeah, definitely. most artists. I was always exceptions. Um, I always say everything we say, we should use the word some... Um, majority or sometimes we can't just always say always yeah you know? i think peak hour is coming so i'm just gonna yeah, close okay. that
Okay. Beautiful. Okay. So, yeah, those are like the difference between mainstream and whatnot. So that's your second, like, I don't know if it's the right word, but your second collection in terms of the live performance thing. Yes. And, and then, then that went around the world. What's yeah. the third? Then I made this series of work. I've made quite a lot of series of works, but I just go with the popularity of them. Then I made this series of works that are five self-portrait of myself. They're the ones all the drawing on your face? Yes. And I scan my passport, Iranian passport, um, every stamp that I arrived in any country in the world um, on my Iranian passport before I become Australian citizen. So every time I travel, they stop me at every airport based on because I was from Iran mm-hmm. and I was holding a Iranian passport. So they gave me so much grief by giving that stamp to get into their country. I had the visa. Everything was fine. But based on, you know, where I was born, I was a hold in the immigration office. Is that because they're just worried about, like, terrorism? Yes. Yeah, okay. And just wanted to Is there to a lot of terrorists from Iran, around the world? The Islamic regime is the only one at the moment and everyone connected to them. So perhaps they, try, they were trying to make sure there's no link to something like that, which is a good question, you know. And that means countries are aware of that. Um, therefore general public like me get caught in it Mm. by being interviewed again extensively at the airport and then okay bang stamp the passport welcome and then everyone's left the airport i was the only passenger that had to enter the country so i I kept all these stamps which uh was part of my 40 pages of my passport i called the series 40 pages so I scanned them and I uh, pressed them uh, with Photoshop digitally on my face. So through five stages, these are building and turning me to a black-looking person, completely dark face. And um, and I remember in, even in Germany, they took me out of the airplane. But a soldier came and called my name and got me out of plane. And then, yeah, it was fine. They looked at my um, husband looking very Australian and white. And then they said, oh, is he your husband? I'm like, yes. And then said, okay, you can go back. So that was like... that easy. That easy. So it felt right for them to allow me back in the airplane. So it was tension, like the level of tension and anxiety was huge for me. And therefore I said, I have to make this to an artwork. So I built all these stamps on my face through five stages. There's also a video art when you see the build they build on my face and um, I think that was uh, I exhibited at Bowness Art Prize at Melbourne Monash Gallery and won People Choice Award so I feel people understood it because this you see this black face a large photograph in a shore and you get closer you realize there's something building up that was the person I no longer new at the airport mm. like every time i felt like i'm someone else and i'm carrying this wound with me that yeah, i don't know where it comes from exactly like oh my god they're going to catch me again like and i always knew that i was nothing wrong with me but i knew that i have to go through this process based on that bloody password so so that series went to hong kong art prize i didn't win but it got to an auction when it got collected by a major collector in hong kong at Four times more than what it was priced. What is the, what's that price? Uh, so it's not huge, but um, so my my gallery normally put the prices back then, like five years ago. My work was about seven thousand dollars, and it went for twenty seven thousand. So it was like unbelievable. Woo. Woo, woo, woo. <laughs> so it was a big auction. That's cool. And and I just never thought a black face <laughs> that is really scary and weird and unusual and. And, you know, it's very strongly, you know, it's compelling and you look at it and you feel un- uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. No, I just can't believe somebody did beat to that level or a group of people did beat in Hong Kong. And so I always feel that was my another highlight in my career. So, and um, then I uh, made another series called... 33 beads, and that's based on the worry bead that mid- religious people in Middle East carry. Oh, and that's one yes, where you like on Yes, like that. and that's, um, that's the chain that I have a problem with, and it's a chain of tradition, chain of religion. 
chain of um, uh, work control and um, what's your problem with tradition? Um, I think it traditions always controlling. I I think we wake up. Who says, for example, you have to get married to be completed? Who says you have to have this celebration a particular day of the year? You know, to feel good and happy. And I mean, these things are pushed on us by mm. tradition and a system and control us that we have to have this calendar and how you have to work around this to feel good. And who says you have to have kids by a certain age? And then if you have first one, you have to have second. So this these are always bothering me. And I feel... What bothers you about it? Because the way I see tradition is like a framework for civilization as a whole, like, and to have... Like workable outcomes. Yeah, and I like that. But I, if someone, for some reason, on her life path can't achieve it, doesn't mean it's a less person than the other. So I see a lot of people who can't exactly be married by age of 40 or 50 because they haven't found that right person. And they constantly feel anxious in society because they'll be looked at as a less of a completed person by the peer pressure, the society pressure, the tradition that push you to be married by a certain age or have kids by a certain age, or if you don't want to have kids, oh, that's selfish. There's all the topics, like, you know, in, in life that that I have problem because I feel it's tradition. Like, I always was bothered by celebrating New Year, for example. You know, it was like, but why we all have to do this? Like... What if, if you don't want to celebrate it that night? Doesn't mean you don't, you know, you're less of a person I mean, than others. I other. have to celebrate exactly. it. Exactly. So therefore, I do. I like celebrating it. Me too, but I, love ce- <laughs> I normally celebrate myself like Chinese New Year, you know, Christmas, whatever that has celebration. Why? But if you don't, feel, people feel bad about it. If you know they don't do it or for some reason they can't. So I feel like there's a certain pressure that comes with tradition and with this whole... You know, you have to do certain things in certain day. And what if if I don't want to? What if I, if I don't, just want, don't. You know. Well, I think that is like, for better or worse. Yeah. A people like, just going along with the social engineering to enforce the so- those traditions, right? Yes. Even if they don't necessarily believe them, because most people unfortunately don't operate with like an absolute critical thinking mind. Most people are pretty sheepish. Hmm. So that's why I think that is, and is. Yeah. Pretty much. Um, I think everything has to be kept in the heart and not be pushed upon others. Um, and if if I'm um, if I have, for example, a friend who hasn't been able to get married and have kids by a certain age, and if constantly get asked daily by women around or, or you know groups around them, that, oh, how come you're not married? How come you don't have children? Oh, like it's unusual, you know. Like, oh, it is. These things has to stop, and I feel there's a need to stop this level of pressure, um, and uh, make people less feel bad if they haven't achieved what tradition or perfect looking thing is. If you're married and have kids and have family, and then if you haven't been able to buy a house by, you know, all of these things that create a perfect family image. And that's that's the part of tradition I have issue with. So with the society I grew up as a child, they're all wearing this, uh, holding these worry beads mm. and they're counting the name of God and past anxiety and all of that. And they're majority men. So firstly, in my work, I put myself and female hands in it. Like, you know, why should it be men? You know, holding all these, these questions. Worry beads. You know, yeah, like women also worry. This is from Middle Eastern, kind of exactly. <laughs> from Middle Probably Eastern, a little more. <laughs> from Middle Eastern experience, yeah, we we get worried also. Like it's, I just love everyone to see everyone as human and not dividing. And because I come from a background of the Islamic religion, religious where everything is divided, mm. I'm against the division. That's the, that's why I'm forcing the two culture to come together through my. Uh, mission and also 
dividing if you're not married you can't come to our party because we all married and have kids or if I have kids I can't come to your parties because you're all single people do you know what I mean this yeah. division that society place on you yeah okay so essentially it's kind of like equality but it's is it is what you're saying an equality that you and I should be treated that we are the same or that we should embrace each other's differences but still have that equality of opportunity to choose how we want to go about our lives. Exactly. This, this the second one? one? Yes, yeah, second yeah, one. Okay. Because I think... Because I don't think we are the same. Like, I do think we yeah, probably have I, a lot of differences. We have to know biologically we are different. And I always say that. But, I, for example, all my gay friends, all my queer community friends, all, you know, all my um, friends who are married with kids and not married at all and never had a kid... I just treat them as all the same to me, even though they have had different life patterns and they have been placed in, you know, different categories. Mm. If you're from um, this religion or that religion, I just can't see you different. Unless you start pointing it seriously to me, <laughs> then I start to see the differences. Yeah, it's like you're more like, hey, I fucks with your personality, you're a nice person to hang out with, as opposed to, I like, I have to only hang out with people that have these set of beliefs exactly. or values. When I was working at Carla Zampati while I was a student in Adelaide, I remember um, a lot of customers would call and say, oh, can we talk to the girl with the accent? And I, um, I always loved it because I was so standing out, and so people could remember me, because like, yeah, the I'm rest of you know the rest. <laughs> so I was making a lot of money because yep. I was remembered by all the customers. Yeah. I was yes, uh, customers would call me um, the girl with an accent. Can we talk to her? So I was making a lot of sales. I was probably number one salesperson in uh, with. You know, amongst the staff, and I felt so happy. And then my what colleague year was this, by the way. This was two thousand and uh, probably between. I worked for Carla two thousand and thirteen to sixteen. And was this in David Jones? Yes, and uh, yeah, you would have totally met my mum. I, I, you would have totally I know, met her. She probably knows me, and <laughs> <laughs> and also Burnside. Quite a while, I was manager there um, before I moved to Sydney. So I worked there for like three years. Um, fully and um, so I was very known by all the customers and um, and, and then they built friendship and uh, which was fantastic but anyway the, the v- I never thought of them calling me the girl with an accent has anything to do apart from the understanding um, you know they're remembering me but then my colleague constantly like saying in to my ears that's racist oh that's a racist comment then it just comes to my head. It's like, oh, I didn't even think about it. I and don't think that's racist. Do you know what I mean? That's yeah, but hard. I don't even think that's racist. I, at all. Oh, I don't at all. I think that's just embracing someone's difference for the most part. And that's how I saw it. But then having that up view, if something comes in, oh, anything went wrong, for example, if someone doing something wrong and they get told and suddenly it's racist, oh, because of your different culture, you've been told of. No. I've done something wrong, so I've been told off. I could be anyone. So that's what I mean. It's just not to push these mm. ideas. Yeah, well, I think that's where the left wing goes wrong. Yes. Is that they see, like, difference as racist. Like, and I have friends from all cultures. Me too. Travelled the world, and it's like, no, it's like, let's embrace and have fun with that we are different. I think uh, uh, as Iranian uh, background, I can say I have always had this appreciation and grateful feeling towards Australian people and white culture, but I have a great understanding of indigenous people as well, that what they've been through, because I come from a country when there's this very heavy control and limitation has been imposed on people. Mm, So I I kind of like, I feel like we are kind of a bridge, which we have huge appreciation for, the platform created by discipline and, and a white society and then what can love be for indigenous. So that huge understanding, we are in the middle. So is artists, artists always in the middle of people. We always try to be the voice of people, general public, to people in power. Because artists, I believe they cannot lie as much as politicians can, for example. We are kind of trusted in the middle we are a bridge between 
uh, people and power people. Mm. And therefore... I believe you can be. I do think artists I mean, get weaponized some for, like, agendas majority. just because they're, like, indoctrinated. That's correct. And they're not, like, critically thinking about it. They're just kind of going along with it but really good at expressing. That's right. I think uh, we always have exceptions in anything we say and we, ha- we also can say majority and rather than saying all of the artists. Um, therefore, um, when I hear people ask me, Nassim, can you please put this on your platform? It's so important for people to know. And I know I know, trust that person and they trust me. And I know, for example, when I put it on, I have lists of politicians looking at my story. And therefore, there's a trust in both sides. And then that's when the activism come to play and you feel like you need to be the voice for those voiceless people. And You're like um, the conduit. <laughs> yeah, the same way as, as I say. Um, I never felt racism in Australia. I've been very lucky not to feel it. Um, and I have been given so much platform, which I'm always grateful for it. And I always want to let Australian know how lucky every Australian is to have this safety, discipline, peace in the country that comes from a history of system that we shouldn't deny and ignore. Um, and of course there are problems, but everywhere it is has problems. And I still believe we managed the COVID the best we ever could to compare with any other country around the world. And and then because I constantly knew the deep down of issues in any other countries from my friends who lived in those countries and told me, and yet here we were getting paid. And yes, we had limitations of not getting out to society, but we had that incredible um, government money that were coming to our accounts, keeping us going. Yes, in terms of like that, I don't think we should have been like necessarily like after a certain amount of time. I understood our initial reaction, but I think after about six months, we had enough information that we could have changed tack. Like for example, I don't think Melbourne should have been in lockdown for like two hundred and seventy days. I think after six months, we should have gone, "Hey, um, this isn't as bad as we thought it was first going to be. Let's figure out how we can manage it and and handle and care for those at risk, as opposed to everybody." I think it was a bit too much of a blanket and I think that we should have had more freedom of choice when it came to the mandates for vaccination. Um, but I do think in terms of like in the for what we did do, we did it with a high level of consideration. Yes. Like those government programs. But again, that has also now it burdened us with significant more debts and fucked us economically in many ways. And I think it's all part of a bit of a tiptoe to totalitarianism and this kind of like, uh, not communist, but like communist leaning style that is rising. Um, I think I always felt Melbourne did worse (laughs) in terms of managing that um, during COVID to compare with other cities. But generally Australia did really well to tackle this whole Whatever they did, just generally did it better than other countries that in Europe and in mm. Middle East, for example. And yeah, what in the Middle East? I don't really know. I so thought they, that a lot of countries just didn't really care about it. So their population just dropped because they all died on the streets. They didn't even get to hospitals. There was no way to get to hospital system. It was filled, like right now in China. It's yeah, exactly China's to fucked. that level, like... There's no hospital. They're burying people in their own homes. That's what happened in majority of countries. Can you imagine Australia? Yeah, you buried half of this building into the backyard because nobody can even get to the cemetery anymore because it's filled. It's it's all already done. Like hundreds of thousands death a day. Nobody can fit in any cemetery. So that's how bad it was. And we knew it because we all have very special friends in all those countries. And we looking, looked at Australia. We were all doing well. We had very minimal number of deaths a day. We had very quickly addressing any outbreaks, etc. And yet Melbourne, to compare with other cities, yes, it was unbelievably bad. Were you stuck in yes, Melbourne for the I whole time? Yes, I was stuck here. And I just felt this extremely, extremely... Hopeless with everything, and I was 
Um, okay, this another part of my art career. So I my work was curated in in a, in a very very uh, high profile museum in New York in 2021 uh, called Asia Society Museum in Park Avenue. Um, not many Australian ever get to that museum, and I was the first female Iranian Australian ever exhibited there. Badass, give me a high so, five. Oh, thanks. Oh. That's good. Well <laughs> Thank done. you. So that was great though, right in the middle of pandemic. So the my I booked accommodation, flight, everything. It was a gala festival for the opening to go to. And unfortunately the whole COVID hit and travel ban happened and there was no way I could get there. So it was a huge crash. Yeah. So I was dealing with that, you know, trauma and then on top of it with all other restrictions. And so I started making new work called Measure of Love based on tears because I was in tears daily and like oh my god this is my one highlight of my career showing my work in New York mm. and in that museum and in that level of a standard of you know exposure and yet not only New York was in COVID the exhibition went ahead my work still it showcased there and catalog came to Australia to me but nobody could go and see it physically so it was just a huge, huge, huge um, pressure and sadness. It's like an anti-climax in yeah, a sense. Yeah, very much. So, um, but yet I'm really happy that kind of um, I have that in my CV at least. So it didn't completely cross off because a lot of exhibition just crossed off forever. You just mm. couldn't even. Well, I guess do New it. York knows about you now. That's like the big thing. Yes, right? and uh, you just Google my name uh, from that museum. You see all the works they did quite a lot of 3D um, style of filming the exhibition for viewers and promoted it heavily. And the work got collected to an, a very special, um, they told me it's a celebrity's house, uh, penthouse, uh, but they couldn't ex- tell me who is the person who collected the work. So I was very happy for the outcome. Is it, is it the oligi- 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 I oligarchy? I don't know. Someone who's, uh, <laughs> can't who's got a huge, huge they're, property. They're part of the Panama Papers. In, uh, in <laughs> Central Park. So oh, that's, that's pretty cool. I know. That's Do you know if it's a penthouse? Uh, yeah, it's a penthouse. Oh, my Lord. It's a okay. huge proper, penthouse. Proper money. Yes. That's cool. Well, that so, would be good for your like evaluations of your work, yes, right? Yes, of course. Everything yeah. adds. And so it's kind of, um, you know, it's a positive side is that happened as a result. Uh, but then yet I even had Australian grant to attend New York that I couldn't go. And so it was a lot of things that ha- didn't happen during mm. COVID. So that bothered me more than even restriction. Yeah, well, <laughs> fair enough. I mean? it's, it's like yeah. the most personal impact. Like art's like your baby. <laughs> yeah, it's just crushed. But then what was that piece? What were those pieces about? They're uh, 33 beats. Uh, the oh, okay, the that beats one. that yep. I, um, I am playing um the beads and then the hands joining me and breaking it apart in a very slow mo video style. Um, very slow. Uh, there's other three pair of hands that slowly come to the, my worry beads and they start pulling it, pulling it, pulling it, and last minute, poof, and it's it like all. the breaking of tradition. Yes, cool. And and just not also tradition in my statement. I say it's the the past. I think that's something belongs to your past and you constantly, you never know you want to hold on to it or you get rid of it as a metaphor. That beat could be a metaphor for your past um, and tradition, of course. And um, and therefore, in some photographic images, I'm still holding on to it like I'm protecting it. And then some images, I'm breaking it apart. And then I made another series of work with Worry Beats in 2013 in Adelaide that exhibited in a project called uh, Then You Knew, which uh, that project won an award, a Ruby Award, uh, run by uh, Contemporary Art Centre of South Australia. Um, that one was eight channels video of men playing with the beats uh, from different Middle Eastern countries. It's eight channel video. And um, the eight men that only you can see is their hands and they're twisting and twirling around these beads in different ways. And all they do create anxiety for the viewer because they're all passing time or being nervous or they have their own way of uh, playing with the beads. That was called What to Do. 
it was addressing you know all these crises that goes to Middle East and every man is an agent for a country and all they do is pass time and not actually do anything about it. So the curator of museum in New York put that work next to my recent work, 33 Beats, and they gave me a big room to have the two works from two different years mm. um, well, speak to each other. There's a pretty big gap between yeah. those, right? Yes, yeah. so 2013 to 2018. Mm. So, and now I have uh, a new gallery, Mars Gallery in Melbourne, who's uh, putting my work together for a solo show in March, and I would be showing a new series of works in Melbourne for the first time and followed by Photo London and uh, so the, some so of the works. So that same work will go over to there? Yes, to Photo London. Where's that? Uh, May. Uh, where? No, well, yeah, where's Photo London? It's, a, it's an art fair um, that happens every year. I have to do actually my research exactly where it is. They nominate a big building normally for these art fairs. Yeah, okay. And it could change every year but it it's not. It's like Melbourne Art Fair or Sydney Contemporary. Um, so yeah, it's kind of a busy year. And then there's a design art fair at NGV that some of my works will be there too. Cool. So it's a busy year. Yeah, it does sound. Like it. What's this? Uh, what is this new collection like? The ideas you are playing with. Uh, so new collection is uh, called uh, Measure of Love and also Impulse. Um, it does address uh, my emotions uh, during the last few years um, about all the crisis that has happened. Um, I'm a war kid. I was born in the middle of Iraq and Iran war. Uh, so I'm more emotional than any other family members. I am always in tears and I express my words with tears sometimes. I, I just, it's part of me to be very teary, tearful girl. So I made artwork, a video art of my eyes, staring at a camera and burst to tears. And then I wipe my makeup with my tears and I clean my makeup and I look at the world with the clean eyes. And uh, so cool. yeah, so that's, a, that's a, just very simple idea and just camera capturing my eyes. And will you have like it blacked out on it's either side? Completely. It's with only the, with that. the hijab? Um, no, no, you can't see it, but it could picture it in your mind that I am in a hijab, but I'm just cutting me, my face just oh, okay, by yeah. my eyes. So that's pretty much my first works. I'm showing that next to the new work, which is a tear collector. And uh, a tear catcher or tear collector is based on 18th century women of Persia during the war, as that country is forever into wars. The women cried a lot because of separation, and they came up with this glass vase that collected the tears. When during the COVID in Australia, I did some tapping the research about tears, female tears. Why do we have? Why do we cry? All of that, and it pushed me to the 18th century women in Persia who created the tear bottles out of glass. And I was like, I have to make this work. I have to bring it back. In my research, there's only two places: Metropolitan Museum in New York and uh, Victoria Albert Museum in um, in London that have a few of these tear collectors from 18th centuries in their collection. I felt like this is the time I bring it back. I have to give it a contemporary voice. Where to make it? Canberra Glasswork. So I booked Canberra. I got a grant from uh, OSCO in Australian Council. I went to Canberra and then through a week, extensive work with fire, we... Uh, oh, are they? They're like that the big? original ones are small, yeah. but what I've created, I exaggerated it to one meter. Oh wow! So like I've ex- I blown up the whole work to yeah. large. It's this is the largest you can. If I could do it like five meters, I would do it. You've got a lot of crime. But I know. <laughs> so it's like I feel like um like the tear bottle that belongs to me has to be huge. Yeah, you got and, a lot of tears you know, to play with. And also, we are very connected socially through social media as well. And I think your fight is my fight, your pain is my pain. We are open, our hearts are open to other countries. You know, you see Russia go through this, Ukraine, you see Islamic regime do this to innocent people. It just 
constantly and your emotions affected. There's a lot going on in the world. Ah, oh, and then and then we just got over pandemic. Mm-hmm. Like we've had already enough and therefore the tear bottles are have to be bigger. Mm-hmm. It can't just be be created the same size as they used to be. But that's a different that's a completely different like idea behind the tear bottle. In terms of that's like a collective vision of a tear bottle, whereas back then, like those tear bottles were like person. very personal between like a woman and her man, yes, and being like you're gone. So like what? Yes. So the the small one is like a perfume bottle. When the family member comes back from a fight, as a son, husband, family member, whoever, so they show that tear bottle on the table. You say this is. That's like almost how much you cried during the separation. Yeah, you're like, I cared for you this much. Oh, yeah. And it could be just like a little As bit. As a little bit. You're I like, know. yeah, I don't you really could, Someone you, told yeah. me what if, if they filled it with water and I'm like, oh, I don't know. They just but taste it. They're like, this is just what? <laughs> <laughs> so it was very fascinating that they came up with that object to measure their emotion. It's very poetic. And I felt I want to bring it back mm. to the world as none of none of that left around us anymore, and I get I, I and the base of making glass is sand and Australian sand, making this historical Persian tear collectors, and globally we all know what tear means or what our emotion is, and mm. and what brings you to tears. Therefore, I just uh, worked and I made this series of glass objects for installation and I made a sand art with a French composer Loan Custer in uh, Paris uh, to listen to that sound while you're looking at the bottles and to feel that emotion to experience the emotion um, and I made the glasses black and white to address the black and white emotion human emotion that can go from white to black um, and uh, so it was a very challenging and very mind-blowing experience to suddenly go from video art, photography, performance to object and especially glass because it's a huge new area and medium to work with. I'm glad I did it. So did you do a lot of the glass work yourself or you just designed it and then said? Mm, we did it together as a team. I did blow because I wanted my breath to give it life. It was very important that my breath... Because uh, you have to blow, and okay. and then and that's almost you giving birth to mm. something. So so important to be my birth, my sorry, my breath giving you birth. Um, but anyone who's done glass knows it's a teamwork. It has to be six people all together to place this into fire. Yeah, back especially and like roll a roll it, and they all oh, you really muscly girls and boys working there. It's a huge work ethic mm. um, and uh, hands on uh, for all these people who work in front of 1500 degree of fire <laughs> it's huge it's, it's like you know it's so really incredible so I'm glad I did that so this would be part of my and then there's a series of photograph part of my solo show that I am holding these bottles as my relationship with the bottle I have like my emotion and how I'm holding this in a s- photographic series. That's cool. Yeah. NFTs, do you get into it? Uh, not yet, but I'd love to get to know more about it to start. I have been uh, asked a few times. I don't think I have had brain space to get there yet. Yeah, fair. <laughs> what, what do you think about it? I think it's cool. Mm-hmm. I mean, it allows you to, like, just from an economic perspective, continually get a royalty from the on-selling of your work. So <sighs> even from just the financial side, it... It has a lot of merit, especially since, uh, from what you're saying, a bunch of your, like, artwork is made digitally. Yeah. So it would fit nicely as well. Yes, uh, video art style. Mm. I don't know if the cultural work I do, how does that sit? I need to quite get to the bottom of that. Yeah, assess that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, look, it's right now is not the best time because mm. everything's dipped. Dip. Yeah. But when it comes back up, it, w- it will. It will go on a wave because the technology of it is very fascinating, and art is just a use case that is very palpable. Yes, um, it's always been on my list of you know things to learn more and understand more and get to the bottom of it. 
But I ha- somehow I feel majority of artists, if you're not into the world of animation and you know that level of digital work that I see on NFT sometimes, um, it's hard to imagine your work end up there unless you know a right person to help you. Yeah, you probably to have to do it there. as a collaboration. But I think uh, that your work would sit. You could sit it nicely there, okay. As well, just because, like for example, the video of someone crying, like that could be, mm. and you could have it as a one of one NFT, okay. And then that person not only gets the, the NFT, that then they get to use with the screen when they hang it on their wall or whatever. But it's like you're selling the NFT as your primary thing for that collection potentially, and then you continue to get a royalty. But also, what other people have been doing with it is using it as a community builder so it's like if you've bought let's say you had a a series like prints okay and you were like you had a hundred prints it's like if you buy one of these hundred prints you get access to this event that i put on you get access to the next five exhibits to the launch I see. Something like that. That's a community builder. Or you get access to the behind the scenes of me actually showing you how I've created this work that other people don't get and then like really strengthen that community of with your collectors. That's very fascinating. Yeah. Mm. And people are doing like there's – have you ever heard of Full Send? No. Uh, they're just a group that started with like pranks and stuff and now they're moving into like beer companies and podcasts and oh, all sorts of entertainment. And they have one that's like 5,000, um, like meta, meta cards. And it essentially, because they're like these rowdy group of blokes, they have like all these parties and exclusive, exclusive events. And like when you buy that, you just get lifetime access to going to all their stuff. I see. Wow. Um, so I think um, it always needs that right person to... For help sure. you get there for sure <laughs> saying, I, I believe in connections and how your p- people can in your circle if none of them have the knowledge you never end up knowing what's going on or if you have someone who has that kind of you know information and knowledge about a particular area then oh my god you suddenly intri- get introduced to that world well, if i find someone trusted <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll pass it everyone on. says that it needs to you really need to trust someone in this world oh for sure because there are so many layers and yeah hair tools and all especially that especially when you're dealing with something like a digital contract it's like That's right. you need that person to fully understand <laughs> what it's yeah. all about but then also just not do you dodgy that's and, right like, help themselves like, Absolutely. Yeah. So true. Mm, cool stuff. Yes. All right, so that's your newest collection. And then all right, let's quickly go back to Iran yes. and all the stuff going here. What have yes. you been doing in regards to all this freedom, like pursuit of freedoms? Uh, so it's 8 million Iranians, about 8 million Iranians outside Iran. Every individual, if uh, apart from the I- Islamic regime's agents, uh, we don't count them, but other normal people, we all in unity using our Instagram, social media, TikTok, any platform, website to deliver the message uh, and from people inside Iran to people outside for creating the awareness and connection because Iranian people don't have internet and they have some, uh, there's a group in Melbourne, they have sourced this internet f- through Elon Musk, oh, yeah, Starlink. the Starlink. And they have managed to send them to some people who are fighting on the streets in Iran so they can actually record this all violence and uh, brutality and send it to this. And that's how media can be informed. So uh, so that activity has been fantastic. We donate money for it. We make sure that you know, there's enough money to buy because this Starlink is not even cheap to do so. That's one activity. The, um, then Australian newspaper interviewed me, which I um, strongly send my message to our government. Uh, yeah, what do you my, want them to do? My disappointment. Um, they have actually have taken some steps that has been fantastic after my uh, after the newspaper published and a few other interviews on ABC News. Um, basically, we want um, Islamic regimes expats to be expelled from Australia and be deported. Um, the reason is, if in your home 
Um, you know your neighbor is a child killer and you know your neighbor um, is a pedophile. You know your neighbor is brutally, um, um, you know, is a criminal person. Would you allow that person to have breakfast with you and your family? Hell to the no. So simple. Yes, You have it to is. put it in the simple language. This regime is now being labeled as a. As they actually like it is in the history of humanity. There's nothing worse than this regime to its own people and to 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 Ukrainian people to others in the region, and um, they formed a, they formed ISIS. This regime, Islamic regime, formed all of this mm. huge terrorist or, terrorism organization, and now. It's time to remove them from our countries. Australia is such a safe platform and has turned to be a lobby for the agents of this, gov- this government. Yes. Unfortunately, this message is very clear to our government, especially Albanese and our government and uh, Penny Wong, to understand this is very crucial. And if... Iranian Australian have been going on rallies every weekend. I have attended at least five, and there is a big crowds of people come, and they all say with the same voice, "Expel these um, terrorist regimes agents out of this peaceful country. We don't need them amongst us. We don't need them, not just for Iranian and Australian that they spy on us, and we all are in danger while they exist in Australia, but also for the future of Australia." We just don't need these members with us. We don't need them to live in our next door neighbor and knowing what they're doing based on evidence to 18,000 prisoners of their own people in their countries. Therefore, yeah. it's very simple. I guess the hard thing there is like, is like if you're an apologist for a regime or like you're going along with a regime but you don't directly do something for it it's like yeah, that's the hard part i guess to expel and then of so there's been a lot of conditioning with the islamophobe narrative i think um when um, you, you have you got caught up in that now that um, you're speaking about this uh not now i think because the awareness is now much better than for example in 2010 when i made my performance that kind of very slightly seen as Islamophobist with my performance. Back then, nobody knew much. Mm. But now the awareness is basic human rights, is freedom of expression. Whoever said woman life freedom inside Iran is in the jail getting raped by Islamic regime and get their hands and legs are being chopped out. It is obvious. There's evidence for all of that. It has been enough voice around the world enough images, enough videos, footages coming out of it. So it's writing is on the wall yeah, when so you're ready like to read it. A going away, like it's like a go away to the Islamic regimes that are operating with those kind of <clears throat> actions as a part of their regime, not necessarily yeah. like go away to all people that enjoy Islam as a religion. Exactly. Because there are it's, more peaceful. It's the Islam that is introduced by this group is just extremist it's ex- exactly so or it's the fundamentalist it, they actually choose you know even they use the quran that has said you can do this to someone who's against you who can chop the legs and arms and you can rape a woman 14 years old girl if they are against what you say so they actually use islam heavily and no today this is has to be. I always put it on my Instagram, and I get hundred percent vote yes. Nobody knows what a core of Islam is as much as an Iranian today on this planet. We have lived through it forty three years. We know upside down what Islam is about, and that rules that are placed and extremists. A lot of people don't apply it around the world, but they are applying it in Islamic regime in Iran on people and innocent people and kids and babies. So what is it about? Like why do people hold on to these uh, beliefs if there's no value? I think there's a certain level of, again, first, education. Second is brainwash. 
Mm. Is there any value? In a, uh, 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 I, I'm atheist, so I'm really, um, I, c- I can only speak about what I believe. But I also know uh, the core of this regime that used Islam and Quran to do what they can do to, to torn apart human beings um, and to kill freedom of expression. That's so simple. It's really basic. We're, women, men, and young generation in Iran, Generation Z leading this revolution, and all they want is freedom of expression to be able to have a normal life. And there is a huge um, number, not, not a huge number, but there's like you would say 10% to 20% of the population is still extremely brainwashed by this regime. You wake up to all of these rules and then you know nothing more than that. You've never traveled to the next door country to know what life could be. Yeah, okay. So you're saying yeah. that people are brainwashed to the sh- Sharia law. Yes. That is taking place in yes. that regime. Correct. And... So in terms of you being like atheist, do you believe there is no higher power? I think whatever is that higher power is right in your heart. I think it's something you shouldn't really speak about it. You know in your mind and heart there's something in control. Like an infinite consciousness, if yes. you will, or like a collective consciousness that is like in a, a, of an abundance in the universe. Or do you think it dies with just with the carbon vessel? I think it's um, <laughs> I, for me. If I wanted to go through this, um, I am human. We never know when we are born. We never know when we are dead. When we can't celebrate our birth, we're just not conscious. We can't even understand we are dead. We can never understand we are asleep because we're just not there. So these things... What do you think about astral projection then? I I do believe in that too. But at the same time, I don't know, I feel everything is an accident in this planet. That's where I get to. I feel we all come from sands and fish and and then turn to where what we are now over the process by scientists who are proving all of this somehow through their extensive study. Mm-hmm. And um, so I do believe in sun and power of the sun and light and all of those. But how much that uh, projection of the sun to sand and turning things to life, um, you know, has contributed to us being around. I do believe in all of those, but I also, you know, that high power exists in my heart, which I can't really talk about it publicly. And then I found, okay, that's not a religion, so I'm atheist. It sounds like you're more agnostic and that you have, like, you know what the distinction is? Yes. Because atheist is you believe there is and there cannot be. We All we are is a carbon vessel. All it is is this is just matter mm-hmm. and there's nothing more than that. I make no stick, sorry. We, can we go back? You should cut this out. <laughs> no, it's, it's, but people, need to, head, this, right? so people so need to know this, right? People need to know it because a lot exactly. of people identify as that, yes. but they're not. Um, and then you start to look at things like quantum physics and they're mm-hmm. starting to make these discoveries that below matter is just energy and frequency. Yes. So it's like everything is actually just frequency and this in just how we experience the universe yes. occurs that way. Yes. But it's not actually this, this thing, way. like this thing yeah. of matter is actually a frequency. Yes. So, um, that's atheist. No, no, that's, that's just what uh, quantum physics has been yeah. finding and yeah. challenging this very material view of science that we have. Uh, or, or like we are not, uh, it's not, we don't exist in a way. Yeah, well, there's, yeah, exactly. Life yes. is an illusion in a sense, but there's, there's just a lot more that we don't know and we can't possibly know. So it's like how... I think it's a bit like arrogant to think that we know everything and to denounce the idea that there is a greater intelligence than us. Yes. Because I do think that there is just like people that record doing like psychedelics, for example, like have said that they they have come in contact, and this is across millennia, there's a connection with this infinite intelligence and then all these people across the world and across the globe – in random time periods have like created these 
phenomenal structures and been gifted these phenomenal insights and one um like I mean, you'd probably experience this as an artist. When you get certain ideas, you're like, how this, this isn't from my brain. Exactly. This just came to me. It was, exactly. like a, it was like a download. Yeah. So that's why it's atheist. When well, that's you believe not even in atheist. That. It's not that. Well, that's not atheist. Because if you believe that there is something more that is allowing you to download, it's not you and your brain in its material form just creating that idea. That's atheist. Whereas if, if, if you're like, I'm downloading this information, like where's it coming from? It's coming from a greater source of intelligence. That's me. Some people call that God. Some people call that Allah. That's me, so I'm agnostic. And, and that may just be how people 2,000 years ago or you know Mm-mm-mm-mm-mm. different time periods of religions just put it together to yep. tell that story. Yep. There's actually an interesting PhD uh, like doctrine dude that is super famous and like – Top of, one of the top of the fields, and he st- was a part of, I think, a small group that originally studied the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, you know the Dead Sea Scrolls? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so those things. And a lot of them just did it and, like, kind of paired it to the doctrine of the Bible. But he looked at it differently, and he is actually saying that the Bible potentially is a metaphor and the, and the iconography of Jesus and whatnot is actually a metaphor for mushrooms a certain type of mushroom yep and that my father mentioned that to me and it's like this whole like you know we uh was it like we eat or drink the body of christ and it's like that actual consumption they were just using words as uh metaphors because they were using several languages i'm butchering this but you get the point yes and they were using words so they didn't uh so it could be hidden in there so they didn't get killed by the catholics at the time yeah or the the Romans, sorry, the Romans at the time. Catholicism probably wasn't a thing yeah. yet. Um, yeah, which is like interesting because if it is that we're using these psychedelics across time to have this greater understanding, there's also this theory that that's also how, because we're the smartest things we know in terms of like functionality in this mm. world, right? Like, we're doing the coolest shit. <laughs> 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 like there ain't no dolphins yeah. doing what we're doing. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, there's a theory. It's like the, uh, was it, the, the ape theory, stoned ape yes. theory, that because of all these psychoactives, it actually linked our neuro pathways differently that we were able to get this cognitive function. Mm, um, yeah, I, my father told me about that one. And also the whole idea of that, <laughs> everything around us is an accident and w- and we are just built of action and reactions that is happening around us so i'm reacting to what you're saying uh, you're reacting to what i'm saying and it's just we we just literally we don't exist so that's an idea i i am interested in it and I'd love to know more about it and get to the bottom of it and all that. I don't think we ever will. Yeah, I don't think we will know. <laughs> but we can entertain it and we can know, go we can down the rabbit hole it. and enjoy it. But the agnostic, yes, I think uh, we please get uh, cut the other That's side. Right, people so, are learning. Yeah, you know, no, it's, it's not great. It's because I just completely switched the two. Because right, uh, I was talking, just thinking of atheists, but I just mentioned that I am one. All good. Um, yeah, so uh, there is so much happens that you don't know why. Right now, I always say to my family, I don't know why I'm an artist. I don't know why I make this kind of work sometimes. It just comes to me. It it flashes to my head. And I just know I want to make this work. And I make it to happen. And then you keep thinking, why it happened? Is it in my DNA? Is this some flashback? Or what, what this imagination comes? Mm. I constantly... Think about the, the philosophy of sleep, why we sleep, why we don't know we are asleep. And and only people around us know that we have slept. And then we just out of it while we dream and then we have a bad dream and then we think that's reality. Supposedly Einstein used to be conscious in his sleep and work on equations in that ethereal realm and he could do experiments in that realm and then when he would wake up he would write it all down Mm. and i know some artists just made artwork about their dreams and literally dali was was famous for that right exactly it's surrealism Mm. but then their theory that says what we live our daily life is surrealism 
our dream is reality. So we actually get out of this surrealism world or get to the reality while we sleep. We have that chance to get out of this. So all of these things, you know, I don't know. <laughs> nobody uh, knows. So, so therefore, I feel like there's a greater power in control of all of that. But then it's, it's hard to name it what it is. Mm. Well, that's what people try, right? Yes. Uh, I think that it's interesting because we're going through this like stage of civilization where we're kind of like shooing away these like religions in many senses, like especially in the West, like we're kind of denouncing religion in many senses for better or worse. I think it's fantastic. for worse. I, 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 I think do it's for best. I don't. I don't. I think we're finding a lot of like demoralization and people are losing per- purpose. I mean, oh. we look at suicide as the leading cause of death, especially yeah. for men, 15 to 44. It's the leading cause of death. Like why are people killing themselves in unprecedented manner? Like we don't have a connection to purpose. We don't have a com- connection to like a duty beyond ourselves. Yeah. Nihilism is taking over and nihilism being it is all meaningless. Yes. And I, I think we do crave meaning. I think the meaning is an important thing. Um, I also think that nihilism when applied to itself can be empowering, but you still have to create your own meaning in your life. And I think that's where for the majority of people, that's where like religion served as that doctrine for that healthy civilization building process and yes reforms happened and some reforms have been great in terms of like leading to this modern lifestyle of being civilized in how we know it today but i do think just shooing it away those like actions and reactions that are addressed in those kind of doctrine are normal let me just quickly restart the oh. camera. I mean, what do you think about what I'm saying in terms of like, because I think like addressing violence, for example, love your neighbour, like, you know, treat their neighbour as you want to be treated and all that. Like without those kind of pillars and those morals, we just become selfish and resort back to tribalism. Um, yeah, yeah. Um. <laughs> There's so much, so many things in the world we don't have an answer for. Um, and there is our brain that, you know, wants to do something. When we are born and we started moving, we always started walking and crawling to the front. We didn't go backward, we just kept going front, you know, ahead. We walked, we start learning to walk and we're always moving forward. So there's something is already placed in our mind and brain to always want to move forward. So I think this subject is very forward thinking in a way, even though I it would push us, you know, religious is backward to me. It's, it's past, it belongs to past and primitive age where people needed that, but now we have science, we have all these new discoveries to to think about and discover more and unwrap more. But at the end of the day, either you have a religion or not, or that you need that all things to hold together that makes you, you know, love your neighbor or love violence, for example, or love or be against violence or all of this. It's, uh, it's like life is like an onion. I always say it's, it's the, the more you peel its layers and at the end there's nothing there. So that's the whole process. You either want to be holding on to religion, you know, or a, a, a building or a, a core or a tradition to keep going or you want to hold on to science and all these atheists and concepts and theories that are constantly bombarding us or you want to hold on to social media and use that as your bible it's really the life at the end is layers that you're unwrapping for yourself or for others and you know and then you know you just have to try not to these layers to get um expired so you just you know you keep the fresh layer coming up and discover that part and it's exactly the same in the art world 
we just keep making work, exhibiting, wrapping, unwrapping exhibitions, and then so what? Mm. We sell, we don't sell. You know, it's just literally life. We hold on to something. Either it's atheist or agnostic or religious or... If, as if we had, there's a balance there, then we need to navigate life and get to the uh, to the end that we we don't know about, like that life after death or whatever the death is, and we wouldn't even know we are dead. So maybe this is a process. I don't know. I don't know what happens at death. I mean, yeah, <laughs> you know, <laughs> can't remember. And birth and death, we nobody never remember. So yeah. you know, I mean, there's some people that say they've died and come back, but I don't know. They could just be there close and they get that mad DMT release. Exactly. Not sure. That is a mystery. It's a fascinating conversation and that's forward thinking, all Mm. of these topics. Yeah, Um, because I like the idea of standing on top of like the older and learning from it, like on top on the the forebearers. Absolutely. And not discarding the messaging and understandings of your forebearers and of the past, but saying and looking at it uh, critically and saying let's continue and revisit and re-understand the purpose of tradition and those traditions that have aren't helping us or conducive to creating us a more prosperous society or civilization, then we discard those things. But I don't think that discarding it completely is a wise thing because in the last 2,000 years we've become, from what we know, the most like the greatest civilization we've ever had in the history we know of. And there are challenging ideas in terms of the history of humanity, uh, like ancient apocalypse on Netflix now saying that there was a extinction level of event 12,000 years ago and we were advanced before that and we just got set back from this huge meteorite shower that hit the earth and similar to the dinosaurs, but we did live on because we were smart, but... It was passed on through hunter-gatherers, so we had to learn this abilities again. Yep. But I do think that – I don't think we should discard. Um, but I also think we shouldn't also discard those who can't stay within that uh, platform of – tradition. Mm. Yeah, because like you should allow for freedom. You should allow sure. everyone to be – and that's that's the message because the the reason I'm against tradition and all these um, uh, limitations that those things create because I see those who won't achieve within this platform they're being disregarded and they've been dismissed and they feel anxious about not achieving what the pressure of tradition gives them and therefore to create that uh, inclusivity uh, in our society and not to I mean, exactly, you talk about suicide. You know, sometimes the suicide just is because you don't reach that level of what tradition wants you to reach. You know, you just feel useless, hopeless, powerless, boom. You don't feel good, bang, you're gone. You know, disappointed in relationships. I mean, at the same time, name a relationship that is extremely successful. It's not. Everything is really, doesn't matter which way. You're still going to have your pain and you're still going to have your joy. Yeah, you still have the human experience. Exactly. So <laughs> so I feel uh, sometimes tradition overpowering and that's where we need to stop and pause and sometimes this openness and lost society that maybe today we have, that we don't, you know, that whole energy, masculinity, femininity, everyone's lost somehow, most majority of people. Mm, definitely. Is it good to mar- to have a marriage, Not to, is it good to have kids, not to have a kids, even even choice of having a pet or not, is all people lost with making decisions. Yes. Um. So then to introduce something, what is good really? What is good or bad? What is wrong or right? Um. This the confusion. So I think this is a period of everyone kind of going through this confusion. Yeah, I do think that is in part. Or not, I think I potentially think, as in it looks like it. It's been a big psyop between countries, kind of demoralizing people and taking away their fundamental pillars through university and indoctrinating the youth into uh, moving into nihilism as opposed to like the fundamental ideas that united us because now like we are united in our fundamental pillars in many ways there's so much we agree upon in this conversation yes totally but for those that can't like even agree that freedom is a good idea 
that is the disruptor that will allow our country to and our peoples to explode from the in, implode from the inside. That's so true. Like what we are trying to do with this revolution in Iran, for example, they are so much fighting to gain this freedom. But does it mean if they get given the freedom, do we want them to be the McDonald's eater on Subway drinkers, uh, um, the Starbucks drinkers? Because we can see the other side, mm. the freedom that can, you know, this heavily be imposed on people and brainwash them in different way. Yes. Do you know what I mean? In yeah, this well, I think America lost yeah, its freedom in exactly. many ways. Exactly. <laughs> so we have to be so careful. It's a women movement, but do we want Western feminism to get to this movement? No, it's men and women are fighting to gain their freedom together, and that doesn't mean we're going to drag down men because we know they've actually been executed for women just to support women in Iran. Therefore, we don't want Western feminism to enter to this revolution. There's a lot of this now we are aware of this duality that, you know, the freedom can create for you. And um, to dismiss um, a man because you're a woman is absolutely now we are standing against it saying this is a rise of men too, mm. um, this movement, because we learn from feminism in the West. Um because we also learned from all of these, uh, lack, uh, the freedom that America gave to its people, you know, they are brainwashed in their own way, I mean, just general public. And so we are aware of all of that while we are going through this freedom movement in Iran and we're trying to be a voice for them. And we, they are so young generation, the gener new generation through social media. They know what they actually want is a normal life, a balance. And and have the everyone religious can have that God and that book in their heart, in their home, and don't impose it on others. And so it's the same way as you know, if, uh, other the other side. We we see the number of suicides that happens in freedom countries with freedom, like Australia, for example. We have the same. The mental health here is as big as what is in in Iran. So why? Do you can see the duality of this whole and sitting on the fence looking at them completely being controlled by Islamic regime and then Australia completely free. But then why the mental health is the same rate? These are good questions. I think we've been demoralised in many ways. and But I think freedom is definitely an empowering place to live life. And still stand on top of our four barriers and go, you know what? In maybe in Iran, say, look, not every. I don't like that the women couldn't uh, wear what they want to wear, but I love our family dynamics. So true. Perfect way to wrap up. Is there anything else you'd like to say? I think it's very good. Thank you so much, Nasim. Where can we find you? Uh, so through my website www.nasimnas.com my gallery is Mars Gallery in Melbourne you can always find my works on their website and Instagram to see my activism movements and giving the voice to the voiceless people what's your username? it's uh, Nasim Nasser uh, underline art so it's N-A-S-I-M N-A-S-R underline art thank you Thank you very much for having me.